Okay, uh, so just a couple of reminders again, guys. I know I give them to you every day, but it's still important. Uh, remember, okay, unit exam, Monday. Okay, so that's coming up real quick. Okay, uh, final overdue assignment deadline, Friday, 2 o'clock. Final exam, Friday, June 19th, 9 o'clock in the morning in the gym. Okay, so make sure you're ready for all of those. Tomorrow, you will get your final exam review package as well as your unit exam review package on paper. I already gave you the final exam review package on Google Classroom, but yeah, I'll give it to you on paper uh, tomorrow. Okay, all right, what we're going over today are two things heat capacity and latent heat. Okay, we talked a little bit about latent heat the other day and we said it was one of those major energy transfer mechanisms okay, in order uh, for the Earth to move energy from the equator where there's lots of energy to the poles where there's less energy. Okay, and latent heat is that energy that water vapor carries as a result of having changed state from liquid to gas. All right, and it takes a lot of energy to change water from a liquid to a gas and as it moves into more northerly areas and then changes state back into liquid all the energy that was used to evaporate it is returned to the environment all right which means essentially it becomes sensible heat that is heat that we can feel the temperature goes up everyone follow me there what we're going to do is look at how those changes in state happen there's a little bit of problem solving to do with it but the math is ridiculously easy okay as is the math for heat capacity all right, there's just a little bit of problem solving, but the formula is really easy to use. Okay, you guys won't have any trouble with it, and we'll be able to get through both of those today. All right, so in general, what heat capacity is, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of something by one degree Celsius. All right, if we are talking about an object, okay, it's how much energy is required to heat that object by one degree Celsius. If we're talking about a specific material, Okay, like iron or glass or water, okay, then it's how much energy is required to heat one gram of that material by one degree Celsius. All right, now you're going to find that there's some big differences here. Okay, and do you guys have the chart in your notes? I don't know if I put it in there or not. I did not, but you'll get it here in a minute. Okay, of specific heat capacities. Um, water has a very high specific heat capacity, which means it can absorb a lot of energy without changing state. Or sorry, without sorry, without changing temperature. Okay? So, if I'm, you know, sitting let's say in Vancouver or Victoria, okay, I'm next to the ocean and the air temperature starts to go down, energy will start to go from the water into the air. That's why proximity to oceans is one of the factors that affects climate. Okay? Now, there may be a lot of energy flowing from the water to the air. But the water's temperature doesn't start to drop, does it? Okay, like the water doesn't change temperature by more than a degree, okay? Because it has the ability to hold so much energy, right? It takes a lot of energy to warm the water, so it takes a lot of energy to go away before it really starts to be noticeably cooler, right? That's why, okay, because of the specific heat capacity of water being so high, that proximity to oceans is a factor that affects your climate. Okay, does that make a little more sense now? Okay. All right, so uh, just definition-wise, it's very possible that there could be multiple choice questions about these definitions okay, on your unit exam, so know the difference. If I'm talking just about heat capacity, I'm talking about an object. If I'm talking about specific heat capacity, I'm talking about a physical property that is specific to one material, and then I'm dealing with one gram of it at a time. All right, the formula for specific heat capacity is this. E equals MC delta T. Okay? Delta means change. So really what this formula is saying is mass times specific heat capacity times TF minus TI. Okay? That's really what it's saying. Most of the time the question will just give you the temperature change, but once in a while it'll be, you know, this thing warms up from 5 degrees to 30 degrees. So what's the temperature change? 25 degrees. I mean, it's not something you'd have to punch into your calculator, right? It's something you can do in your head. All right. So, um, C, the specific heat capacity, is a number you're going to get from a table that I've I've got on this uh, sheet that I'm going to give you in a minute. Okay. Uh, if it's on a test or something like that, the question will either give it to you or there'll be a chart of specific heat capacities on the test one way or the other. All right. Um, and then mass for this, we're not in physics anymore. So now mass goes back to being in. 
grams. Okay, this is chemistry again. Okay, it's thermal chemistry, right? So we are dealing with mass in grams now. All right, and again, the question will usually give it to you in grams. Just understand that you need to keep it that way. All right, now um, for specific heat capacity, okay, the units for specific heat capacity are joules per gram degree Celsius, which would make sense. It's the amount of energy needed to heat one gram of a material by one degree Celsius. Right? So that's why the units are the way they are. All right. Is manipulating this formula going to be pretty straightforward if they're all being multiplied together when it's in this form? Yeah. If I want to solve for delta T, what do I do with M and C? Divide them. If I want to solve for M, I divide by C delta T. Right. So all you're doing, it, whatever you want to solve for, divide the other stuff over. Okay. General rule, you'll never go wrong with that. Okay. Is that making sense? Okay, so the problem solving for these is really, really easy. The big thing we need to know about specific heat capacity is its effect okay, on weather, okay, climate. So we talked about the proximity to oceans being a place where that's a big factor. Okay, but also in the design of structures okay, and, and devices and technology. Uh, for example, if I want to make a pan for cooking stuff, do I want that pan to get really hot really quick with very little energy input, or do I want it to get to heat up really, really slowly and require a lot of energy to heat it up. Oh, other way. I want it to get hot, right? If I want to cook something in a pan, I want it to get hot real quick. Agreed? Yeah, so I want it to heat up quickly. I want it to have a low specific heat capacity. That way, the energy I'm putting into it isn't going into heating the pan, it's going into heating the food I put in it. Right? So in a situation like that, we want to understand that low specific heat capacity is more valuable. Right? Now, if I'm making a oven mitt to protect my hands from lifting this pan out of the oven when it's raging hot, okay, do I want those to be made out of something with a high heat capacity or low heat capacity? High. Because right, when I grab onto stuff, I want them to be able to absorb energy but not get hot. Okay? At least not really fast so that I have time to grab the pan and put it somewhere else before I you know, burn my hands. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's kind of applications of, of specific heat capacities in the design of certain types of technology, right? So anything that is a good insulator, we generally want to have a high heat capacity. It doesn't change temperature very easily, okay? Anything that we want to have as something that's going to transfer energy quickly, we want that to have a low specific heat capacity because then it will heat up, get hot, and move that energy more quickly. All right. I'm going to give it that. Yes? All right. So copy this one down. Okay, this is an example of a specific heat capacity problem. Okay, we're going to go through one of each kind. I'm going to have you try a few on your own, and then we're going to move on to latent heats. All right. So our first question, how much heat energy is needed to raise the temperature of 150 grams of water Okay, which has a specific heat capacity of 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius from 5 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius. We don't have time to chit chat. Shay, we don't have time to chit chat. We just have time to write this down. All right, I got to write down my givens. Question is asking for how much energy. So E is a question mark. And it wants to know the, uh, how much is needed to raise the temperature of 150 grams of water. So they gave me mass, 150 grams. Okay. Uh, they gave me the specific heat capacity, 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. And they gave me the ability to find the change in temperature. Okay, the change in temperature goes from 5 to 85, so the temperature change is 80. Okay, so my formula is E equals MC delta T, All right? And again, guys, by the time we get to the final, it's going to be really, really important for you to write down your givens, okay? Because you're going to have formulas, well, only one formula from chemistry, but it's the mole equation, okay? You're going to have all those formulas from physics, and you're going to have two more formulas from this unit. 
Okay, actually three more formulas from this unit. So we've got to be able to figure out which one to use. If I write down my givens and I've got E, M, and C, I know I'm not doing a physics problem involving one half mb squared. Okay, or vf minus vi over t. All right, I don't have the stuff for that. All right, do I have to manipulate this formula? Nope, it's already set up to solve for E, so all I have to do is plug in my numbers. 150 grams times 4.2 times 80. Oops, that's what I want. All right, 150 times 4.2 times 80. All right. 50,400 joules. Is that a lot of energy? It is. It takes a lot of energy to heat water up. Okay, Water has a very high heat capacity. I know 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius probably doesn't seem like a very big number, but it is. Okay, That's only 150 milliliters of water. All right? It's less than a cup. A cup is 250 mils. Okay, so we're talking a very, very small amount of water here, and a very large amount of energy is needed to heat it. All right, so water has a high heat capacity; takes lots of energy to make it hotter. All right, questions on how that one worked? Okay, pretty straightforward. All right, um, you know what? I'm going to pass out this sheet here, so you've got the um, specific heat capacities. Okay, so on that sheet you've got there, okay, you've got a list of substances and their specific heat capacities. All right, so if a question asks you to figure out which substance it is, you're solving for specific heat capacity because it is specific to each material. It's one of those, it's a physical property, just like the ones we went over in chemistry. Here's a valuable review for you, okay? We went over physical properties in chemistry, things like whether solutions conduct electricity, solubility, pH, okay, state, melting point, all of that kind of stuff, all right? So specific heat capacity is a characteristic physical property of a certain material. All right, so we're looking for, we've got M, 100 grams in this question, okay? And it takes 4,200 joules of energy to raise its temperature from 12 to 62 degrees. So my temperature change is 50 degrees Celsius, 62 minus 12. All right, well, the thing I don't have is C. That's what I'm looking for. So E equals... M times C times delta T, and I'm looking for C. So I divide M and delta T over to the other side. Everyone with me so far? Okay, plug in my numbers, 100 grams divided by, um, no, sorry, 4,200 joules, sorry, 4,200. divided by 100 grams times 50 degrees. Okay, and I do have to make sure that I do the bottom before the top, okay, or that I put it in brackets, otherwise your calculator will do order of operations and spit out the wrong answer. All right, so I'm getting a heat capacity of 0.84. So I go down my list here and I see that glass has a specific heat capacity of 0.84 joules per gram degree Celsius. So it would make sense. It's a cup. Cups are sometimes made of glass. Okay. So that would be a reasonable answer. Okay. Everyone okay with that one? Anyone still need that work? All right, for number three, what's the final temperature of a 185 gram block of iron initially at seven degrees Celsius if it is heated with 200 joules of energy? All right, so again, write down my givens here, 200 joules. All right, the initial temperature, not the change in temperature, the initial temperature is seven degrees Celsius, okay? 
Uh, it tells me it's iron, so I'm going to go to my chart here and find out what the specific heat capacity of iron is. And it's 0 0.460. And they tell me it's heated with, or sorry, that uh, we have 185 grams of it. Okay, if I want to find the final temperature, what part of E equals MC delta T do I need to find? Okay, TF, but TF isn't part of this formula, right? I've just got E equals MC delta T. So what should I solve for there? Delta means final minus initial. So if I solve for this, delta T, can I use this to figure out what TF is after that? Yeah, so it's kind of a two-step problem. It's not a hard two-step problem. You'll probably do the last step in your head. Okay, but we got to find delta T here because we're dealing with one of the two temperatures. So I divide both sides by M times C. All right, that leaves me with delta T. So I'll have 200 joules okay, divided by um, 185 times 0.46. Okay, so we got uh, 2.35 degrees Celsius is my temperature change. All right, if I started at 7 degrees, what's my final temperature? 9.35 degrees Celsius. Okay, so like I said, I mean, that last step you're probably going to do in your head. Okay, that would be the hardest they would get because it has two steps. Okay, the rest of them all work exactly the same. All right. So I'm going to give you guys about 15 minutes or so. I want you to work on this. Okay, pick some at random. Actually, no, sorry, they go, uh, yeah, pick them at random because I think they go in groups of five where you're solving for the same thing for five questions and then you're solving for the same thing for five questions, okay? So maybe like do one, five, sorry, uh, do one, six, eleven, yeah, let's just say that, let's go with, do one, six, um, 11, 16, for now. Let's just try those for now. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to do those, and then we'll go over them. If we're getting those, then we're going to move straight on to latent heat because there's a little more to do with that. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes on that one. All right, so we've got... Uh, this person stocking shelves and she notices smoke coming from another part of the store. She reaches the back door and finds the temperature of the door has risen 50 degrees Celsius because she has one of those thermometer hands that when you put it on the door you know exactly how much hotter it's got. I don't know how she knows that, but anyway. Okay, she knows that it's hotter because, of course, she checked the door before you open it, which you should always do in a fire. Okay, um, so we've got a temperature change, a delta T of 50 degrees Celsius. The door has a mass of 10,000 grams, so it's a 10 kilogram door. Okay, but we do need it in grams. Okay, and it had, the fire has generated 230,000 joules of energy. Okay, we're looking for what material the door is made out of, so we're trying to find the thing we don't have, which is C. All right, so we got E equals MC delta T. To get C by itself, we divide both sides by M delta T. All right, so C is going to equal 230,000 divided by um, 10,000 times 50. All right, and when we do that, we should get the specific heat capacity for iron, which is 0.46, right? Okay, everybody with me there? All right, for number six, 
Uh, we have a 500 gram glass being filled okay, with, um, with very cold soda. All right, so we've got M equals 500 grams. Okay, we know the material is glass, and the specific heat capacity of glass is 0.840. Okay, and that's uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, temperature of the glass drops 15 degrees Celsius. So that's our delta T. How much energy did the glass lose? So this one's really easy. I don't even have to manipulate. I can just plug all my numbers in here. So we'll have 500 times 0.84 times 15, okay? And if I do this exactly right, I make that 15 negative because it decreased in temperature, and then I'll get a negative energy, which would indicate that's how much I lost. If you don't put the negative in, it doesn't matter, okay? You get 6,300 joules no matter what. Okay, questions on that one? Everyone's all right with that one? Be all right, Braid. Be okay. Okay. All right. For number eleven, we've got a uh, person making KD here. She applies sixty thousand joules of energy. Okay, and it's one point four kilograms of water. How many grams is that? One thousand four hundred. Right. Okay, um, and of course we know it's water, so we know it's 4.2 joules per, per gram degree Celsius. Okay, so we're looking for the temperature change here. So E equals MC delta T, and we divide both sides okay, by M times C. All right, so what we'll have there is uh, 60,000 okay, divided by 1,400 times 4.2. Right, and we should get 10.2 degrees Celsius. So she's kind of slow going in getting the water to boil okay, for making KD here. All right, and for number 16, solving for mass. Okay, Kara is making itchy band. Okay, uh, so she must heat water from 50 to 100 degrees Celsius. All right, so we know that the de temperature change is uh, 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, and we know that she uses a million joules of energy. And uh, we're looking for um, the uh, mass of the water, knowing that since it's water, C is 4.2. Right? So M is going to equal E divided by C times delta T. So that'll be our 1 million joules okay, divided by um, 4.2 times... 50, and that gives us 4,761 grams, which means she's making eight and a bit packages of itchy band because you're only supposed to use two cups of water per pack. Okay, and that's 4.7 liters of water, which is a lot of itchy band. Okay, all right, questions on any of those? Is that making sense? Okay, so let's look at latent heat here. So you got this coming up there on, in your notes package. There's a, this picture is on there with the tea kettle. Okay. Um, so there's two types of latent heat. Yeah, there's two types of latent heat because essentially there's two kinds of, um, of state changes. There's the state change that involves liquids and solids, and there's the state change that involves liquids and gases. Okay, um, so... If we're looking at water, because water is the most common material, okay, and essentially the only one we're going to deal with in this unit, um, we want to look at what we call its specific latent heat of fusion and its specific latent heat of vaporization. Specific latent heat of fusion has to do with changing from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Okay, so melting and freezing is the one that this one has to do with. All right, so that deals with this part of the graph. Okay, the specific latent heat of vaporization deals with the state change here. From either liquid to gas, which would require an input of energy, or from gas to liquid, which will 
What will it do with energy? When water condenses into a liquid, energy is... Is given off. Remember, that's what we talked about. That's, that's that latent heat, okay, that is a major energy transfer mechanism. Okay, water evaporates at the equator, it moves forward as a vapor, moves northward as a vapor, and then condenses. And when it does that, it releases all the energy that it absorbed when it changed state from liquid to gas. All right, so that's kind of the, the latent heat of vaporization is the latent heat we deal with most often because I've never seen ice move from the equator northward. And it generally doesn't do a very good job going the other way, okay? Going from north to south, it generally melts before it has any chance to do anything else, okay? All right. Now, looking at this graph, okay, what we see is that we've got temperature on the y-axis and we've got energy, heat added on the x. So as I add energy, and let's say I'm starting at the bottom of this graph here, where I have ice at minus 25 degrees. So if I start adding heat, so let's, let's just say I put a block of ice in a pan. I turn on the, the stove. Okay? I start adding energy to it. The ice doesn't melt right away. Right? The ice heats up. Ice won't melt until it gets to what temperature? Zero degrees Celsius. So I have to heat the ice before it gets to that temperature. Or sorry, before it'll start to melt. I have to get it to that temperature. So once I get the ice to zero, then it'll start melting. And what will happen, according to this graph, to the temperature while it's melting. It's not going to change. Okay? The temperature of the water ice mixture, provided you keep stirring it, will not change until all of the ice is gone. That's why we put ice in drinks. Okay? It keeps them cold, yes. It keeps them at a certain temperature until all the ice is gone. Okay? Now, why do we add ice and not just cold water? Okay, but I mean the ice becomes water by the time it's melted, it's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, I could just add really cold water and that would not in the end be exactly the same as putting ice in once the ice melts. Okay, it's not a solid. What can ice do, according to this graph, that liquid water would not have the ability to do? If I put ice in there, and the ice is even, let's say, at zero degrees Celsius, it starts here and absorbs energy. If I add water that's zero degrees Celsius, because both can exist at zero, okay? if I add water at zero degrees Celsius, I'm starting there. Which one can absorb more energy from my drink, ice or water? Ice. Okay, that's the reason I put ice in. It's not because the ice is colder. I mean, the ice might be minus 5 or something like that. But the big thing with ice is that it still has to change state. And to change the state of something requires a lot more energy than it does to change the temperature of something. All right, in fact, for ice, for water, okay, it takes 333 joules for every gram of ice to melt. All right, so for every gram of ice I put in, compared to water, I could absorb 333 more joules of energy. All right, that's why if I'm going camping, okay, and I've got my cooler full of stuff, I don't fill the cooler with really cold water. It doesn't have the same ability to absorb energy from my food and keep it cold as the ice does. Okay? The ice will do a better job because it still has to change state from solid to liquid and in the process absorb tons of energy in order to do that. All right? Does that make sense? Okay? I know you all thought we just put ice in because ice was colder, but that's only a very small part of it. It's the fact that changing the state of something requires a lot of energy. That's why we use ice to keep things cold. All right? um, same thing would, go, would be true with... Um, a lot of scientific companies, if they want to keep something really, really cold, they ke keep it in liquid nitrogen. Okay? Liquid nitrogen is A, exceptionally cold, and B, takes a lot of energy to change state. Right? If you've ever, uh, it's kind of like the stuff they use to 
burn warts off. You don't have to admit if you've ever had that done, but okay. Um, they they dip like a Q-tip or a cotton swab in liquid nitrogen, like instantly freezes, and then they stick it on, and and it freezes the the wart or whatever it is they're taking off. Okay, that's kind of how they do it. All right. Um, so I've got this block of ice in the pot, and the pot is heating up. The ice gets to zero. The ice melts. Now, after a little while, the temperature will start going up because all the ice has melted. All right, so I've changed the state now from solid to liquid. I'm going up now. I'm, I'm continuing to add heat to this water. Eventually, the water is going to start to what? Boil. When it gets to boiling, what happens to the temperature again? stays the same. And it will stay the same until all the water has boiled away. I don't advise trying that at home in a pan. Okay? Because if you do, all the minerals that are in water, and there's a lot of them, get left behind and they burn onto the pan. It smells awful. It ruins the pan. And, and yeah, it's don't do it. Your mom will not be impressed. Okay? If you ruin her best pot or your dad, which everyone does the most of your cooking, okay? will not be impressed if you ruin their pot at home. All right, so we heat it, we heat it, we heat it. Now, which one takes more energy? Changing the state of the, the liquid to gas or changing the state from solid to liquid? Yeah, liquid to gas. Look how much more energy, right? Like we start like right here, okay, and we don't finish till we're right here, but for ice, it was only this much energy. It was hardly anything. It's the same amount of water. I started with that block of ice in the pot. Right? It's not like I have any more material than I had before, but it takes way more energy to change the state of water from liquid to gas than it does ice to liquid water. Okay, And here's the number, 2,260 joules per gram. So if I have one milliliter of water, it will take 2,260 joules worth of energy to evaporate it if it was already at 100 degrees Celsius when I started. Now, you probably all had a shower this morning. You don't have to admit if you didn't. Okay? But when you get out of the shower, before you get a chance to grab the towel and dry off, you start to feel what? Why? Why do you feel cold? Well, it's not that you're not under the hot water anymore. I mean, certainly the water's cooling off a little bit. But if you were to just stand there, not that you would do this, but if you were to just stand there, would you eventually get dry? Why? Where's the water going? Well, some of it's dripping off of you, I suppose, but most of it is going to what? Evaporate. Where does it get the energy to do that from? From your body. So, second law of thermodynamics says, if it's taking the energy from your body to evaporate, you have to get colder. Okay? That's how sweat works. Okay? When you sweat and you're, you're working out and you're working hard, okay, your sweat begins to evaporate. For every milliliter of sweat that evaporates off of your body, you lose 2,260 joules worth of energy. Devin, take that thing out of your ear. Okay? Everyone follow me on that. 2,260 joules of energy for every milliliter of sweat you evaporate. That's a very effective way to cool yourself off provided you have enough water around to replenish all the sweat you sweat out. Okay? So it works really, really well. That's why our bodies do it. Okay? Now, some animals obviously don't sweat. Okay? Like, uh, like dogs don't sweat. They pant instead. Okay? How does that cool them off? Well, actually, they're doing the same thing. They're evaporating moisture off the back of their throat which is right near their carotid artery, which is the artery that takes blood to your brain. Okay? Uh, so they evaporate water right next to those main arteries, and that cools the blood next to those main arteries, the blood that's going to the brain. Okay? And then, of course, it, you know, it cools them off a little bit more after that. Right? If you're you know, an animal that lives in a dry environment and you don't want to lose lots and lots of water, that's how you cool yourself off. Okay? You don't sweat because you'll lose too much water. That making sense, right? So, obviously, do we sweat though usually more than we need? Yeah, and most of the sweat drips off of you as opposed to dries off of you. But if you've ever noticed on a hot sunny day, if you just stand still, you feel hotter than if you move around. Okay, if you're moving around, running about, whatever, you increase the rate of evaporation of the sweat off of your body, and you'll feel cooler by actually increasing your physical activity as opposed to just sitting there in the sun and cooking. 
So it works pretty well. Now, like we said, generally we do tend to sweat more than we need to. Um, some people more than others, okay? Because sweat is most effective if we have a thin layer of it covering our body. Right? That way it can actually evaporate from our skin and be effective. Now, if we're wearing, like, let's say a heavy sports uniform or heavy sports equipment or something like that, we inhibit the ability of sweat to work properly. Okay? So if, you play, if you're playing football in full gear on a hot day, you really have to mind your, your uh, water intake. Okay? You have to be taking in a ton of water because a lot of the water is just getting absorbed by your equipment and not evaporating and cooling your body. Okay? Um, a number of years ago, a guy named Nikolai Habibulin used to be the goalie for the Oilers. Okay? He sweat like crazy. Okay? They actually caught it on the goalie cam once. He had holes drilled in the bottom of his skates to drain the sweat out of his skates. And they caught it dripping out of his skates one time on the goalie cam. Okay? This is why the Oilers were no good in a shootout. Because right? he would be, by the end of a game, he would lose 10 pounds in water. Okay, just in sweating. In between periods or any time there was a break, he'd come back to the bench and get a new catcher and a new blocker. Okay, because they would they could do this with him. Okay, the guy just sweat like crazy. But how do you get cool? You're covered in all this heavy goalie equipment that's just absorbing your sweat and not allowing it to evaporate and cool you off. So you just keep sweating. All right. So I mean, yeah. Granted, you're on the ice. It's supposed to be cold there. But I mean, if you've ever played hockey in an arena that's big and full of people, it's not all that cool. Okay, especially if you're doing that in like April, right? Not that the Oilers have been in playing hockey in April in a while, but okay, I say that as a sad Oiler fan too. All right, um, so is this making some sense here? How this graph works? Okay, once I evaporate all that water, then the steam will start to heat up. And we mentioned about how steam, okay, can burn you worse than liquid water because a it's hotter. And B, it's absorbed all this extra energy. If I'm comparing steam at 100 degrees versus water at 100 degrees, steam has a lot more energy in it than water does. Okay? And this is why latent heat can transfer so much energy from equatorial regions to more northerly regions. Okay? Because, because it's carrying a lot of extra energy. I mean, if you think about how much water vapor would be in a cloud that's moving from the equator northward, we're talking about thousands or maybe even millions of liters of water as a vapor. And every gram of that is carrying 2,260 joules worth of energy. Okay? So that's why it's such an important energy transfer mechanism. And that's one of the things we need to understand moving forward okay, when we're explaining that stuff on an exam. Okay, so specific latent heat effusion has to do with melting or freezing, okay, and it's the amount of heat required to melt one gram of a substance with no change in temperature. The latent heat effusion for water, okay, is 333 joules per gram. So for every milliliter of ice you have, you will need 333 joules worth of energy to melt it. That is why if you make a snowball with your bare hands, your hands get frightfully cold really fast. All right. It is taking 333 joules of energy from your body for every milliliter of water or snow you manage to melt into liquid water. Okay. That's a lot of energy. 333 joules is a lot of energy. I don't recommend that as a weight loss plan. <laughs> okay. If you're like, Ooh, well, if I just like constantly make snowballs or roll around in the snow, I'll lose lots of energy. You'll also get hypothermia and die. So that's probably not the best plan. Okay. All right. Now, formula used here, E equals MLF. If I want to figure out how much energy is needed to melt a certain amount of ice, I take the mass of the ice and I multiply it by 333 joules per gram. Right? I mean, that makes sense. If it's joules per gram and I multiply by the number of grams, I'm going to be left with joules, okay? which is the energy. So here's what we're moving towards. We want to be able to solve problems where if I give you a certain amount of ice at a certain temperature, you could tell me how much energy would be required to heat it to steam at a certain temperature. Okay? That's where we're headed. Now, the math of that is really easy because all we're really talking about here is potential thermal energy and kinetic thermal energy. And we have the formulas for those. Okay? 
what formula do I use if I want to figure out how much energy is required to heat a certain amount of ice from a certain temperature to a certain temperature? We just used it a few minutes ago. Certain material, certain amount, change in temperature. Okay. E equals mc delta T deals with figuring out how much kinetic thermal energy you have. Right? Because kinetic thermal energy is changing anytime the temperature is changing. That's what we see on this graph. All right? So anywhere where this graph is going up, we use E equals mc delta T. So we use it down here. And we would use it up here as well. Okay? We use it because there's temperature changes going on anywhere where the graph is going up. It's a graph that has temperature on the y-axis. Everyone follow what I'm saying there? Okay? If I'm changing the state of something, well, if I'm melting it, this will help me figure out how much energy is required to melt ice. E equals MLF. So I would use that down here. Okay? Why can't I use E equals MC delta T right here? Because there's no temperature change, I'll get zero, which is right. I'm not changing the kinetic thermal energy here, I'm changing the potential thermal energy there. Okay? That's why the line's flat. All right, now, for the next part of this, okay, we've got boiling or condensing. Right? Similar formula, E equals mass times the latent heat of vaporization. That is 2,260 joules per gram. Okay, so if I want to figure out how much energy is required to evaporate a certain amount of water that's already at 100 degrees into steam that's at 100 degrees, then I use this. All right, so as we said in that last slide here, okay, anywhere the line's going up, I use E equals mc delta T because I got a temperature change. Down here where it's freezing, I would use MLF. Up here where it's vaporizing, I would use E equals MLV. You'll never have to manipulate those equations in a problem like this. All you will have to do is identify where to start and where to end and do the calculation. Just plug the numbers into those formulas and add the energies together. All right, that's all that's going to happen here. Okay, so let's look at an example here. All right, let's say that I've got... Um, I'm just going to take... Let's say a question asked me to calculate how much energy is required to, to heat, uh, let's go with 100 grams of ice at minus 20 into steam at 110. Okay, so this will cover every single step. Write this down. This is a good example for you to have. Okay. Because I will ask one like this on the unit exam, probably on the final exam as well. It's easy mathematically, so it's easy marks. All right, so this question starts out at minus 20. So that's down here. Okay, it ends at 110 degrees, which is up here. All right, so all I expect you to remember for this is what temperature does ice melt at and what temperature does water boil at. I'll give you the numbers. Okay, I'll give you the 333, the MLF, the MLV. I'll give you all of that. Okay, you just have to remember okay, where water freezes and where water boils at. All right, so I'm starting here and I'm going to end up here. It says anywhere where the line goes up, I've got to use E equals MC delta T. And anywhere where it's flat, I use one of the other ones. So how many steps am I going to have here? Five. Okay, I've got five steps. I'm going to have to use E equals MC delta T right here, okay, for this step. I'm going to have to use E equals MLF right here for this step. E equals MC delta T for this step. E equals MLV for this, and then another small E equals MC delta T for that one. 
Okay, so there's five steps. Now, often at this point, I have people ask me, Mr. Kudair, why can't I just do E equals MC delta T once and just do the whole temperature change? Anyone know why we can't do that? There's a different amount of energy for each one of those E equals MC delta Ts. Yes, because, weirdly, ice, water, and steam all have different specific heat capacities. Their C is different. So I can't just go once E equals MC delta T and pick one of the three because I won't get the right answer. Okay, I've got to use each, the fact that ice has a specific heat capacity, as you can see on your formula sheet, or sorry, on your uh, sheet that I just gave you there, ice is 2.116, water is 4.2, and steam is 2.02. .02. They all have a different heat capacity. So I got to do separate calculations. It's like a whole new material. Okay? Water's weird, right? If there's an exception, water's the exception to the rule. Okay? So um, we have to make sure that we're doing that, those th four or those three, sorry, separately. So I'm going to break it up into the steps. Okay? In step one, I'm heating the ice to zero degrees Celsius. So I've got a temperature change. I know I'm using E equals MC delta T for that. In step two, so now I'm here, the temperature is not changing anymore, I'm melting the ice. So for that step, I'm going to use E equals MLF. After that step, I'll have liquid water at zero degrees Celsius, and I'm going to heat it up. So if I'm changing its temperature, I'm back to E equals MC delta T. In step four, I'll have I'll start with water at, at 100 degrees and I'll end with steam at 100 degrees. So I can't use MC delta T because there's no temperature change. I'm going to be evaporating the water. Okay. And then in step five, I'm going to be heating the steam. So that's again E equals MC delta T. Okay, everybody follow there? All we got to remember is what parts of the graph we use what formula on. Okay, now I just plug in numbers. So we said the mass here is 100 grams. So 100 times 4.2 times, how much am I heating the ice by? I started at minus 20. How much am I going to change the temperature of the ice by? By 20 degrees. It'll only be ice until it gets to zero. There's another common mistake people make. A lot of people will say, I'm going to change the ice, the ice's temperature by 130 degrees. No. Okay, I'm not changing the temperature of the ice by 130. Over the whole question, I change the temperature by 130, but it's not ice the whole time. It's only ice till zero. Okay, so times 20. All right, figure out what that is in a minute. In step two, okay, E equals MLF. Well, I still have the same amount. The mass isn't going to change. All throughout this thing, I have 100 grams of water. Whether it's ice, whether it's liquid water, or whether it's steam, I have the same number of mo molecules of water. So I have the same mass. So I go 100 times 333. Because okay, that's what LF is. All right, in step three, I'm heating up my now liquefied water 100 times, 4.2 times, how much am I heating it by? Mm -hmm. Exactly, 100 degrees, because I'm starting here and I'm going up to the boiling point, so up by 100. In step four, I'm evaporating the, the water that's now at 100 degrees, so 100 grams times 2,260. Okay, latent heat of vaporization. And then in step five, I'm heating up the steam okay, from 100 to 110. So I have 100 grams times the specific heat of steam, 2.02. .02. Oh, look at this, guys. No one caught my mistake here. What's the specific heat capacity of ice? 2.116, right? After all that and saying that we should make sure we don't do that, I went ahead and did it anyway. Okay, and then times 10 degrees over here. All right, so now we just punch those numbers in, and when we have the number for each step, what do we do with all the numbers? Add them up, because we're looking for the total energy for this whole thing. All right, so 100 times 2.116 
times 20. Okay, gives us 4232 two joules. Okay, then uh, 100 times 333, which would be 33,300. Yeah. Oh, I added an extra zero there, I'm not sure why. It should be 33,300. All right, and then for this step here, we've got 100 times 4.2 times 100. All right, so 42,000. All right, so, I mean, just compare those two numbers, right? Like, it took 33,300 joules to melt the ice, and it only took 42,000 joules to heat the water by 100 degrees Celsius. So changing state really gobbles up a lot of energy. Okay, and then for this step here, we got 100 times 2,260, so we'll be looking at 226 thousand joules, okay, which is a lot. All right, and then we've got a um, hundred times 2.02 .02 times 10. All right, so that's 2,020 joules. All right, so the math is, is pretty straightforward. Just punching the numbers into our calculator. We don't have to manipulate or anything. We just got to know how many steps and what steps to do. Okay. All right, so when we add all of those together, so um, 4232, sorry, yeah. okay. plus 33,300 plus 226,000 plus 2020. Alright, so we're looking at 307,552 joules worth of energy to heat 100 grams of ice until it's steam at 110 degrees. Alright, is that a fair amount of energy? It is. Alright, that's all there is to it. There aren't any tricks to those kind of questions. They're not all going to have five steps. I would not ask you a five-step question on a unit exam because it'll take you too long to do. Okay, probably like three. All right, so you might be looking at changing ice from minus 15 to water at 40 degrees, and then you would have three steps. Okay, now that's the big thing that we got to be able to do in a question like this. Okay, is identify how many steps there are. So we basically you got to draw this picture because you're not going to be given this picture. All you've got to be able to do is this. Remember that shape. Anywhere the line changes direction is the start of a new step. So in the example I just gave you, I'm heating ice from minus 15 to water at 40. How many steps is that going to be? Three. One, I got to heat the ice to zero. Two, I got to melt the ice. Three, I got to heat the water. Right? That's the only thing you got to remember is the shape of that curve. All right. I want you guys to try that one right now. Okay, give you a couple minutes to try that one, and hopefully we'll be able to solve it together here okay, before the end of class, because tomorrow's class is unfortunately going to be an entire 85 minutes of me talking very, very, very fast, because i got to get through the entire biome lesson, which I can do as long as I talk really, really fast. Okay, so to start this one out, I draw a quick diagram of the heating curve of water and I mark start and end points. Okay, my starting point, ice. My ending point, steam, okay, at 150 degrees. So basically top and bottom, how many steps? Five, okay, so it's just like the example we went over. There's five steps, okay. In this step here, in step one, I'm going to be doing E equals MC delta T. In step two, I'm going to be doing E equals MLF. In step three, E equals MC delta T. Step four, E equals MLV. Step five, E equals MC delta T. All right? Anywhere where the line is diagonal, I'm using E equals MC delta T because the temperature is changing. Anywhere it's flat, I'm using one of the EL, E equals ML formulas. Okay? 
All right, so for uh, step one here, okay, we're going to have our uh, E equals MC delta T. All right, so that'll be 250 times the specific heat of ice. Didn't make the same mistake this time, okay? And that's going to be a temperature change of how much? 15 degrees, okay? Because it's only ice till it gets to zero. All right, and then in step two, I'm going to have E equals MLF. So that's going to be 250 times 333. Okay, in step three, I'm going to have um, E equals MC delta T. So that'll be 250 times 4.2 this time, because now I'm dealing with liquid water. And I'm going to change its temperature by 100, all the way from 0 to 100 for that one. Okay, in step four, I'm going to be evaporating the water. So that'll be E equals... MLV, okay, and that'll be 250 times 333, or sorry, times 2,260. Okay, the latent heat of vaporization. And then in step five, I've got E equals MC delta T, and that'll be 250 times 2.02, .02, and I'm heating that by 50 degrees, right? Not 15, 50 degrees. Okay, so when we punch all of those in, okay, I'm just going to do them all in one step here. Okay, so 250 times 2.116 times 15, okay, plus 250 times 333, plus 250 times 4.2 times 100 plus 250 times 2,260. Okay, plus uh, in brackets 250 plus uh, or sorry times not plus times. Um, 2.02 times 50. So, you should have got that answer, 786,435 joules. All right, we'll see you guys tomorrow.